is of national significance um, in the United States. Um, we received special funding and support from the United States Environmental Protection Agency under the Clean Water Act to protect and restore water resources in the Chinook area. So this um, graphic shows you where the other NEPs or National Estuary Partnerships are in the nation. Okay, so the Chinook area encompasses 5,000, our area encompasses 5,416 square miles. Um, and our estuaries include Lemon Bay, Donna and Roberts Bay, Charlotte Harbor, Pine Island Sound, Okaloosahatchee, San Carlos Bay, and Estero Bay. And our rivers include the Mayaka, Peace, Kalusahatchee, and Estero. And the inland and coastal communities include 10 counties that we service and 25 cities. So we go down to Lee County, all the way up to Polk, over to Manatee, down through Sarasota and Charlotte. All right, so we are grassroots and citizen supported. We need your help. We rely on our citizen scientists and our volunteers to do what we do. Okay. and we're community driven. Um, we do have a citizens advisory board and a large team of volunteers um, who directly assist the implementation of our various educational research and restoration projects and initiatives. And we do have the power of partnership. We have hundreds of partners um, in those 10 counties. Um, we're a public private partnership. We're consensus based non-regulatory, we are science-based um, and we're citizen supported, okay? And the Chinette, because of private contributions, volunteers and donated in-kind services has been able to provide more than $19 of restoration for every dollar it receives of federal government funding, okay? Um, so we do have four different committees that we work um, with. We have a citizens advisory committee and that would be um, all of you and we meet every four months. Our meetings are always open to the public and all of the information's on our website if you ever wanted to zoom in or come in person. Um, we also have a policy committee. So we meet with commissioners and mayors and the governmental officials to bring people to the table and partner together. And we have a technical advisory committee. So scientists, all of the scientists in the area in those 10 counties. Um, we have some scientists here as well. Um, you know, Kate Rose, hello. Uh, from Sea Grant and the IFAS and UF. And then um, our other committee is management committee. So all of the water quality managers, all of the land restoration managers, things like that. Hydrological managers, very important, okay? So those are the people that we work with. Um, but then you can see, we also work with NOAA, obviously the EPA is um, who funds most of our um, endeavors, um, cities, right? We have Johnson Engineering in there. We have all kinds of different, um, partners, Swift Mud. All right. So the plan that runs us is the Comprehensive Conservation Management Plan. We call it the CCMP. Um, we have an abbreviated version of that over at the table. Um, it's like a three page brochure in Spanish and English. Um, the actual CCMP is about 300, page, um, 300 pages. Um, and it goes through our four different topics, water quality improvement, hydrological restoration, fish, wildlife, and habitat protection, and public engagement. Okay, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Belinda. If you need me, I'm over here, and I'll be here. Um, thank you for being here again. Hi, everyone. Uh, nice to meet you all. Berlina here, so I work at Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission's Fish and Wildlife Research Institute, um, and I'm the statewide coordinator for the Florida Horseshoe Crab Watch Program. Sorry about the mask. My mom's immunocompromised, so I'm trying not to take anything home with her. But if you can't hear what I'm saying or need me to repeat myself, no offense, just let me know. Also, as I give the talk, if you have questions as we go, raise your hand. We, it's not like you have to hold the questions till the end. Um, so let's jump into it. I'm going to hit biology and management. Um, the first thing you're probably thinking with horseshoe crabs is they are very strange animals. And they are. They're incredibly unique. Uh, only four species in total still exist on the planet, but they've been around forever. Um, and when you're out in the field, especially at like Bayshore uh, Live Oak Park, you're gonna see a lot of um, people maybe ask you what you're up to because what you're doing is, it's kind of strange and people are curious. 
Um, so this talk kind of helps you answer those questions as you get them, because these are a lot of the things that we get asked about the most often. Um, so first off, fortune crabs are arthropods. So like insects are arthropods, um, uh, spiders are arthropods. Uh, they have an exoskeleton made of chitin. I have my trusty model here. Um, uh, bodies divided into three major parts, the prosoma, which is the, the top part of the head part here, the opithosoma, which is the rear part after the hinge, and then their telson or their tail. Um, and they have five pairs of jointed appendages and as well as two little chelicerae or what those little guys are called there, um, which kind of is how they are broken out into where they align on the, uh, their taxonomy. Um, but the big thing you can take away is that they aren't crustaceans. They are crabs, or, or are not crabs at all. They are arthropods, and they're kind of their own thing, but much, much more closely related to spiders, ticks, and scorpions if you're really going to go from that direction. But as you can see here, um, horseshoe crabs are only very distantly really related um, in a subphylum to spiders, ticks, and scorpions, and then they branch out, and they never see them again. Uh, so they are very far away from that. They are the genus Limulus and then uh, species Polyphemus. Uh, and fun fact, Polyphemus is the name of the Cyclops in the Odyssey. Um, and that is because it kind of, this horn here kind of looks like it's a Cyclops, even though, you know, they got the two eyes here as well. Um, and they are really, really, really ancient. They pre-date um, dinosaurs. They've survived all of the mass extinctions so far. So hopefully this coming one, <laughs> they'll survive as well. Um, so they are living fossils. So you can see the oldest fossil we have of horseshoe crabs is from about 445 million years old, which is close to half a billion years, if you want to round up. Um, and they have not changed at all, at all, really, for 200 mil million years. You can see their closest uh, extinct relative is Limulus darwini, which the video is kind of covering, but they look the same is the, the idea. And that guy went extinct, you know, back in the Jurassic period. Uh, so when you think about the other three living species of horseshoe crab, they live out in Asia. Well, um, our horseshoe crab, Limulus polyphemus, is more closely related to something that went extinct 200 million years ago than the ones that are alive today in Asia. So that's how long ago they branched out. But so little change, even in the um, other species over there. And it's basically because, and I'll say this now, uh, they kind of landed on a system that worked for them and stuck with it. When you hit it right with the evolution, why would you need to continue to evolve? They kind of got the body shape right. They got the systems working. Their immune system is incredibly powerful. So they, they, what's, what isn't broke, you don't fix. And so that's why we've had horseshoe crabs around for half a billion years. Um, and are they dangerous is another question. You'll get a lot when you're out in the field. And the answer is no. They're really sharp, they're pokey. That's because they don't wanna get eaten. But they have no defenses. If they pinch you, there's no power. It's not like a blue crab or a stone crab. It's nothing compared to that. They have a very little power there. Um, their tail is sharp, but there's no venom. They can't bite you. In fact, well, there's a slide for this, but their mouth is right here. They couldn't want, they can bite you if they tried. Um, so they're really truly harmless. I will say the only time you could really hurt yourself with a horseshoe crab is when they're flailing around with their back like hinging like that. You get your finger caught in the hinge, that hurts. That's about it though. So, um, and the other thing here, this slide points out, which I think is also a very good thing because you may see people doing this. If you see a horseshoe crab get, it's on its back, it's struggling and stuff, or if you just see it in the water, do not pick it up by its tail. This is like the equivalent of being picked up by your baby toe. And they have ligaments here and a lot of musculature. It, it will break that. And, and they already have a way to right themselves um, with their tail. If they lose their tail, that becomes a lot harder to do. And they may die by getting stranded if you're not there to flip them. Now, if you see them upside down, do feel free to flip them. Um, you're saving their life. It does help, it makes a difference. But hold them by the prosoma or like and the epithesoma like this if you would like to, but um, just don't pick them up by their tail. That is very painful. If you see somebody doing that, if you feel comfortable enough, say, hey, that's, that's really hurting them. Please don't do that. Like, you know, because they might not know that. And I mean, I think I picked up a horseshoe crab by its tail when I was a kid because who was telling me? So um, some other cool things, many unusual and primitive traits, which is like primitive because these are things that have evolved millions and millions and millions of years ago. 
Um, and so, as I mentioned, they have a mouth right in the center of their body here. And so as they're walking, their legs are moving and their mouth is chewing. And then they have these little chalice or these little claws in the front here that throw the food into their mouth as they walk. So they're like little vacuum cleaners or little ocean Roombas that sort of crawl around on the ocean floor, throwing stuff in their mouth, which is right there and chewing as they walk. It's, it's a pretty cool layout. Um, they have their operculum, which if you've seen a fish, the, the gill bone that's over their, um, their gills is their operculum. Of course, you perhaps have one of those too. I'm just gonna come move this oh, into sure. the corner so oh, that sure. way you don't have to be distracted by it. <laughs> and uh, so they have uh, yep, their operculum, which covers up where their um, eggs come out and the sperm comes out. And then underneath that, they have book gills. And book gills are kind of cool. You actually see book gills in tarantula. So you can see where that branched out similarly. Um, that's a style of, of breathing that they share with the tarantula. It's a, it's a very primitive, very ancient style of, of, uh, of ways to get oxygen into the, the body. Another thing, it's not mentioned on this slide, but horseshoe crabs have a really, really good at living in poor oxygen conditions. Um, and so if they're out of the water, as long as their gills stay wet, they will survive for hours or days, um, as long as their gills are wet. So if you're out in the field and you, you know, you have one in a bucket, make sure their gills are wet. You don't have to put water in the bucket. That actually doesn't really, it doesn't make a difference at all. Um, but you know, don't worry about them being out as long as they stay cool and their gills stay wet. They can be out of the water for a long time without any long-term damage. Uh, sensory abilities, again, some weird stuff going on here. They have the two eyes, their two compound eyes are here. We have a lot of models around the room too, so please feel free to take a look when, when we're walking about. But they have the two compound eyes, eyes like a fly has basically, you know, the little circles everywhere. Um, and then they have more eyes, they have UV sensing eyes here, and then two around their little um, uh, polyphemus horn in the center that are also UV sensing eyes. They have eyes underneath their shell around here, some on their telson to orient themselves to what is you know up and what is down. Um, and then they really have sensory organs all over. So when you pick them up, they know they're being picked up. They, uh, they know that you're touching them. They can feel it. And they, so they, they are covered in sensory organs, even though they look like they're just a hard shell, they are not. Um, they, they know what you're doing, which is pretty cool. Um, but you, you know, want to be gentle with them. It's not like you're holding a, a snail that really does have just a hard shell on the outside. Um, so what eats them and what do they eat? Uh, they eat um, everything, all the crud on the ocean floor, like they'll eat worms, clams, snails, they, they will decimate a clam bed if you, you know, have just recently seeded it out. So they're not, uh, a lot of uh, clam fisher, fisheries are not fans of horseshoe crabs. Um, and just sort of just all around the ocean floor, kick stuff up. What eats them as adults? Not a lot. Loggerhead sea turtles love these guys, can chop right through it with their big beaks. Um, sharks will eat them, alligators will eat them as adults. But once they hit adulthood, the shape and the very, like very little meat kind of is, works in their favor. So there's not a lot of predation at, as, at adulthood, but loggerhead sea turtles, sharks, uh, sometimes striped bass, they'll do some serious work. Now as eggs, they're an incredibly important food source to a lot of migratory shorebirds. The red knot, which I'll talk about in a little while, is one of the main ones, but all sorts of animals eat those eggs and they're an important uh, source of food for a lot of wildlife. Juvenile phase, I think a lot of stuff picks them off, but, uh, but you know, so basically as adults, not a lot. As eggs, a whole lot of stuff will eat them. Uh, so now let's get to what we're all interested in because we're gonna be doing spawning surveys. They have a very unusual, very unique pattern of reproduction. Um, so they actually reproduce outside of water on the shoreline. And males have, once they hit maturity, develop these um, clasters, which I have a, a, it, uh, on this model here. One has, the, there's a clasper on one side and there's no clasper on the other. But it's kind of like a boxing glove with a little hook at the end. And so the male will hook onto the female's epithesoma, so the rear of her shell, with both of his claspers and hold on directly above her. And she'll crawl up onto shore and uh, bear, dig, her, dig a nest, lay her eggs, and then the male will release the sperm over top of it. Like if you're familiar with how frogs reproduce, it's very similar idea, like external fertilization, which is very unusual in uh, 
arthropods even, really. So it's kind of cool that they even do this. Um, and then let's see. So the female will lay eggs in about 10 to 20 centimeter deep little nest that she's digging, lay about 2000 per nest, cover it up, move over to another part of the beach, lay some more eggs and repeat that process. They can have, a large female can have about 60,000 eggs inside her. Um, her body size, females are larger than males because they need to hold more eggs. Um, and sperm is, is much easier to produce an egg, it's much more energy um, draining. So that's why females are much larger. So they produce more eggs, lay them. And it takes the females about a, a week um, to do this. Uh, so during the spawning season, they'll, they'll lay their eggs, all of them at once, and then they won't spawn again. Now, again, males return repeatedly because sperm is limiting. It's much easier to produce less energetically taxing. So they will come back and spawn several times, both the fall and spring spawning season. Um, and then but females take a, a full year, um, but they're externally fertilized, like I mentioned. So just on the spot. Uh, what's kind of interesting about horseshoe crabs is, as I mentioned, the males attach to the females, right? And when they do that, when their the claspers are attached to them, they, the male can't eat because their, their body, their mouth, which we know is right in kind of their chest, our chest area, um, is covered by the epithosoma of the female. So they are not eating when they are in like mating mode basically. And so it's again, pretty energetically taxing. So what some male horseshoe crabs have figured out is, oh, I'll just hang out by the side here, you know, like have a female who's got a male attached and then there'll be a satellite now here or here or even more scattered around. And I will lay, uh, my, or release my sperm right near there and hopefully some of the eggs will get fertilized. And this actually works fairly well. Um, they can fertilize as many as 40% of the eggs laid, which if you think about the energy it takes to be a satellite male versus a, like a male that is fully attached paired with the female, you know, you might want to do that. And as males get older, we've actually learned with the data we've collected from this program, their uh, claspers may break off. And so they have no choice, they have to, be a satellite male if they want to reproduce and all wildlife has two purposes in life they want to reproduce and they want to live those two things are the two things they the only things they care about so they're going to keep trying to reproduce even if they don't have claspers anymore um and so you know we found that a lot of the older males tend to be the ones who are in the satellite position because they've lost a clasper they're not as in energetically able to stay on and sometimes males will be attached to a female and the female will miss the tide or something or say, oh, I'll be back in around the next high tide, which could be two weeks from then when the next moon rolled around. So that male is not gonna eat for about two weeks or more. You know, So it, it could be a real, real drain to your system uh, if, if you decide to go with the paired position. So the mating tactics are really unique uh, with the, this training and the YouTube videos that you'll watch, or if you haven't already watched them, we'll watch when you get home. Um, we'll, help you determine what is a parent isn't our section five which is outside will also help you with that but we want you to count that kind of information so we can determine oh it's the older males who are being saddled or tend to be satellites it's the younger males who are tending to pair up with the females that sort of thing um and so the timing this slide also touches on the timing of the spawning events is also very very important so as i've been mentioning the high tide is the key time when horseshoe crabs tend to spawn and they tend to spawn around the full and new moons, generally around the spring and fall in Florida. Now, if we went up to the northern part of the horseshoe crabs range, they only spawn once because they really uh, only once in the spring. Um, and I think it's a temperature thing, a longer growing season here in Florida. And the fact that a lot of our tides are twice daily, that sort of changes things up here in, in Florida. So we have uh, a spring and fall peak spawning seasons. Um, but they nest at the highest point of the high tide line um, around the full and new moon, which, you know, the full and new moon is when the gravitational pull is the strongest. So you have the highest tides around that time. Now it's not perfect. Thankfully, we have NOAA's tide prediction that we can use that they also factor in other factors like um, the hy hydraulics or hy whatever. The water channels and the way that um, freshwater input comes into the systems and the layout of the shoreline also affects your tide high times, uh, high tide times. 
Um, so we use that information to determine when, when the highest point tide is, and then the, that's when we go out and survey because they want that high, high tide line because they lay their eggs along that line because it is the Goldilocks zone. So they don't want their eggs to dry out. They don't want their eggs to get too wet and moldy and, and um, anoxic, so no oxygen. So that Goldilocks zone is the high, highest high tide line. And so that's why we survey at the time and that's why horseshoe crabs spawn and lay their eggs at the time. It just is the perfect part of a, a beach or a shoreline for them to have their eggs at the highest likelihood of survival. Um, so after they lay their eggs, uh, these guys will leave, the adults will leave, um, and the eggs will develop in the sand. Uh, it takes a couple of weeks to turn into embryos, which are really cute. There's some really great Nat Geo um, video. If you ever like Google horseshoe crab eggs um, on, on YouTube or something, adorable. Um, so I highly suggest that. Um, and then they turn into the trilobite larva, which we were talking about earlier. Um, so they aren't related to trilobites, but look at how closely that looks to a trilobite. So you can see why they were called trilobite larva. And they'll stay trilobites for two to four weeks, depending on temperature. Um, they don't really eat at that time. They may free swim in the water. Um, we've had volunteers actually spot these guys before, you know, very volunteers with good eyesight, I guess, um, spot them. But they're, you know, the eggs are look, small, but still visible to the naked eye. And so are the trilobite larvae. So you might spot them later into the spawning season, because, you know, if it's three weeks after the first survey and there was a good spawning event, then they would be hatching out around that time. Um, and then they metamorphose into juvenile horseshoe crabs, which look exactly like they do as adults. They're just little baby versions of it. From there, they grow. They usually, you'll find juveniles on mud flats closer to the shoreline. Um, as they get larger, they push farther and farther away from the shoreline. Um, they never ever get beyond the uh, continental shelf. Horseshoe crabs don't like that deep of water. You'll only ever find them closer to the coast. Um, but they'll molt 16 to 17 times in their life um, and get bigger each time. It's sort of um, parabolic, I guess. So they, it, it rises pretty rapidly. They molt a lot when they're very young and then it sort of is more gradual once they hit maturity. So they'll mature at either nine or 10 years old. Usually males mature at nine and females at 10 years because again, females have a larger body size. Um, so they get one more molt in usually. Um, and once they have molted, once they hit adulthood, um, at nine or 10, they do not molt again. The body they're in is the body they're in. And so, and, and you can't actually identify a male, uh, a horseshoe crab as male or female until they hit maturity. The males won't have a boxing glove until their final molt. So you can always tell if you're looking at a juvenile crab that you can't, you can tell them a fully adult male every time because it will have those boxing gloves. It is done molting. Now it's a little harder with females. Yes. Yeah, um, so when you're out there and see the small ones, yeah. you're not sure about how short that is, but you're not tagging. It, yes, but the nice thing is, if we're surveying on the high tides, the likelihood of you seeing a crab there for any other reason, horse crabs do not come out of the water unless they're adult or mature and spawning. They're not ever going to crawl out of the water. So you would, it's unlikely to see a crab, like you may see one a little off the distance, but if they're actually crawling up onto the shoreline at all, that's a, a crab that is is mating and is planning on laying eggs or, yes. You said that the, um, the guys on my side, um, are the full moon. Yeah. That means out during the middle of the night? A good question, no, it's just time of day. Now they could be, because but it's the tide that they're they're cued in on. It's not the, the actual time of day. They'll spawn at night and during the day. For the sake of everyone's safety, we only do daytime surveys, um, but they will spawn at night. So we do get night spawning events quite quite often. Um, it just depends on which of the two tides we have here are, are the higher of the two. Um, so, but but it's not, it's, the moon is just kind of what makes the tides high. It's the tides that are what make them head to shoreline. So um, yeah, that was a good question because that's, uh, Something that like you, you have to separate and it, you have to think about. Yes. Do like smaller crabs that molt less? Because I assume there's like a size 
spectrum, even when they're fully mature. They do. And in fact, I didn't have it out here, but I have in one of our folders a like a guide that shows you how they they actually molt more when they're younger. And then it, it slows down as they get older, it takes them longer to hit that molting phase. But we have a size guide for molts that you can check, which I'll pull out when we're done talking so you can take a look. Um, but they'll molt several times the first couple of years of their life in a year. And then it gets to be about once a year until they hit maturity roughly. Um, and then one thing here, another thing to note with the molting is uh, we get a lot of like, we have, sometimes I get calls from the fish kill hotline that FWC maintains saying, oh, there's so many dead crabs on the, the beach. There's so many dead crabs. And I'll be like, okay, um, you know, you know, can you get one for me? And then go ahead and feel that front prosoma, that front lip. If that splits, that's a molt. So that's just the shell of the crab. The crab is fine. He's probably happy as a clam, eating a clam out on the tidal flats, you know? Um, so that is the easiest way to tell if you have a crab that's either actually, actually dead or if it's a, like a molted crab is just feel that front lip. Um, and if it splits, it's a, it's a molt. It is not a living crab anymore, or it's, it's not the living crab that crawled away. Um, so just that's something to keep in mind. Uh, all right, so once they hit adult stage, as I mentioned, that's it for them. The body they're in, just like us, is the body they're in for the rest of their lives. And it will take damage as time goes on. When they first molt, uh, but young is gonna bug me, but it's okay. Um, it is that they're the, they first molt, they're, they're actually a little slimy. They're a little bit hairy. Um, they have a lot of fine hairs along the edge of their uh, epithesoma and then around the edge of the, the, the hinge of their prosoma that you can see. They'll have little to no scarring. Like for females, uh, as they mature, it, the more males that they mate with, they'll have scars right around their epithesoma here. If they don't have those scars and it's a female, you're like, oh, this is a young female. This is probably her first season in the field, that sort of thing, or in the field, like in, in like as a mature adult. Um, so you can determine it's young that way, very shiny, uh, no marks. A medium crab, well, actually, I'll skip the old and then just say everything in between is a medium. But older crabs have a, a substantial amount of pitting on their shell. Their shell will be matte in color, uh, like a lot darker because a lot of things have been growing on it. They'll have a lot more likely to have a lot more injuries because they've accumulated injuries. They can no longer just crawl out of their skin like they used to. Um, and so that is how we determine if they're old. And then medium is everything in between, usually a little bit of pitting. A little bit less, uh, a little bit less um, of the hairs. A little bit less. They're not slimy anymore. Maybe a little bit of damage. Everything in between is a medium. So if you're kind of on the fence about if it's a young or a medium or an older medium, go go with medium. You when you see an old crab, you know it's old. When you see a young crab, you kind of know it's young. Um, so that's kind of what I the rule for for that. But so horseshoe crabs, after they hit maturity at nine or 10, um, they live, continue living for six to eight or more years with a total lifespan from 15 to 20 years. Although I think the record is about 26 years. So crabs live a long time. They have about, you know, hopefully six to eight years of re like reproductive activity, which is really important. Um, and when you're out in the field, you will age them roughly, uh, like to put them into that category of young, medium or old. Uh, and the reason actually the way that scientists figure out how to age them. So some of you may know about how horseshoe crabs have horseshoe crabs fish have otolith, which are their ear bones and, and otoliths, the ear bones of fish work like the rings of a tree and you can age a, a fish using its otolith. Horseshoe crabs don't have that. But what scientists figured out how to, to do to age them once they hit maturity is uh, they looked at slipper shells that had attached to their horseshoe crabs and use the rings of the slipper shell to age it from there, knowing that the, the horseshoe crab is not molting again. So if the sh slipper shell is eight years old, it's been attached to this crab for at least eight years, we know. So that's how they figured out how to age crabs beyond maturity, um, which is just kind of a neat fact. You don't have to know that, but I think it's cool. Um, so the next thing you might get questions about, are these guys endangered? Are they going extinct? Well, they're not listed as endangered. Um, they have a very wide distribution all the way from the Gulf of Maine down to the Yucatan Peninsula. Although you'll note there aren't any horseshoe crabs in the Gulf, uh, like on Texas's side, anything beyond the Mississippi Delta really, all the way to the Yucatan. Um, and then they pick up at the Yucatan, it's very bizarre. 
Um, and all species are, um, they're all still considered one species, but they are genetically distinct from each other. And there's very little breeding be in between these populations. So individual populations of horseshoe crabs are vulnerable. Um, Florida populations, actually we have five to six genetically distinct populations. And the local smaller populations are certainly uh, in danger of extinction. Um, and uh, the status of Florida populations is still pretty well unknown, which I'll touch on why that is. Um, so uh, we are trying to figure these things out. So when somebody asks you, are, are, are they, you know, are they in danger of extinction? You can say, well, that's why I'm here. <laughs> We're trying to find out. Like we want to get some estimates of their population size, understand their movements, see if there's some sort of uh, interbreeding between these populations, see where they are. Um, and all of the data collected by this program goes to both FWCDPUs for management decisions as well as U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Um, so the data we're collecting is actively used uh, by state and federal agencies. Um, and technically anybody too, you can FOIA it. <laughs> it's all public knowledge. So if you wanted that information, I'd give it to you. But you can also get it, you know, the public has access to this information that we're collecting, which is also really important. Um, so then I'm gonna actually roll into management and then Woody will take over as soon as we get to the citizen science section. Um, so management and some of the reasons why horseshoe crabs where our population status is, is unknown and why it may be declining is there are multiple stakeholders, multiple reasons why this, this animal really matters. Now, I said this yesterday, I'll say it again. All wildlife has intrinsic value. We should just want stuff to live. It's a good idea. But if there are reasons, you know, like if, if there's money or industries behind it, then we have to make some management decisions on how we want to make sure that the resource exists, continue to exist. Horseshoe crabs are more than just a resource, but you know. So um, back in the 90s, uh, a fisheries, federal fisheries management plan was enacted by the Atlantic States uh, Marine Fisheries Commission, which they manage a lot of uh, Atlantic, uh, Atlantic coast fisheries, large fisheries. And they're a guiding body for all the states on the Atlantic coast to use those rules to guide their state level uh, management decisions. Um, they established maximum number of bait harvest um, and stabilize that bait harvest around a million a year. Um, they also have a biomedical harvest um, and that, that banana Florida, which is, I will explain more when we hit that point. Um, but a lot of the bait and birds kind of work in conjunction because the birds are very important. So, so there are basically three Bs uh, to management, which is why we have the bait birds and biomedical. Uh, and I also mentioned here that we have an aquarium trade uh, here in Florida, which is unique. So horseshoe crabs are harvested in a huge portion of their range by trawler by hand. Um, they're used as bait in the whelk and eel fishery. Um, so the whelk fishery, we, we don't actually have a whelk here, the, the kind of whelk that we're talking about here in Florida. Um, but at one point in time, well, or horseshoe crab were collected here in Florida to use for bait for that fishery. And that is actually what caused Florida to start saying, oh, we, we need to do something about this. Because until a resource is used, we don't generally manage it proactively. Florida, or FWC is kind of a reactionary agency. So, you know, if fishermen are like, oh, let's go grab horseshoe crab, if, if there are no hard rules on the books, then it's going to be not, ex it's technically not exploited because there were no laws saying it was being exploited yet. And so that is what happened in the 90s with the whelk fishery opening up. All of a sudden, a huge number of horseshoe crabs were being collected to be used as bait to collect these whelk. Um, and management decisions had to be made very, very quickly to stabilize the population because they were declining rapidly. Um, and then I also mentioned they're also harvested here in Florida for the aquarium trade, which is um, unique to Florida, only state that collects horseshoe crabs at that phase. Um, and they're collected as juveniles, two to four years old, um, which is a little interesting um, because you, you, you pull an animal that matures at nine or 10 years old out of, out of the population at two or three or four, and it is not reproducing. It's not contributing to the two things it's supposed to do, survive and reproduce. It's not getting to do one of the two things. It's, it's point in life. So um, that is probably having long-term impacts on our populations as well. Um, and it's actually kind of interesting if you look uh, at our 
Cape versus marine life graphs here, Florida, and this is for specifically for Florida, Florida has a very minuscule bait collection. Uh, we have almost no people still collecting uh, horseshoe crabs as a, for strictly for bait, but we have very large numbers of horseshoe crabs being collected for the aquarium trade. And the reason for this is because, as I mentioned, it's the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, and that means the Atlantic coast. It does not mean the Gulf Coast. And so on the Atlantic coast, we have a bag or a limit of 9,455 crabs. On the Gulf Coast, well, it's FWC's decision, and we don't tend to do bag limits. And so it is open season still, which is a little frustrating. Now we have product licenses in place here. So this is how, if you wanted to collect horseshoe crabs, this is how you legally, what licenses you would need to do it. Um, saltwater product license, 25 a day. The marine life endorsement will get, so that's the aquarium trade, that will get you 100 crabs a day. Um, eel will get you 100 crabs, biomedical, no bag limit, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, but one thing that is nice is they are starting to grandfather out that marine life endorsement license. So if you are retiring as a aquarium, you know, specialist collecting fish and things like that, your, your license, it, it's, it either has to go on to your family or it's erased from our system and we do not offer others to reduce the impacts of that trade. So it, it's a gradual decrease. So, but it's still the number of horseshoe crabs collected on by aquarium trade is much higher than what the Atlantic States Marine Fishery, Fisheries would approve of. So it is kind of a little frustrating. And the other thing is, it's kind of funny, there is a Gulf States Marine Fisheries Commission, but they don't care about horseshoe crabs because Florida is really the only one that deals with horseshoe crabs. So they're like, we're not gonna make an effort. So all the more reason to have this data. FWC doesn't move without hard numbers. And even then it's sometimes hard. So we are getting the data every day here in areas where the aquarium trade was very active to say they're not here or they're here in very low numbers. And we can keep, collecting data to hopefully use enough to talk to the commission. That's high on my list. We tried in 2014. We're gonna try again as one of my long-term goals to get some positive movement towards reducing uh, the aquarium trade and just in trade in general of horseshoe crabs here in Florida because of all these other external um, things that are affecting their population. So being here, collecting this data, so directly influences management decisions in the state there's not a lot of programs where, where it would do that, but I can safely say I've used the data from this program to make uh, help influence or help make uh, the management department of FWC help them make decisions about horseshoe crab habitat. They've call, called me up, they've emailed me saying, hey, do you guys have numbers here? And I'm like, oh yeah, we do actually. And you know, that influences their permitting decisions, stuff like that. So it's kind of cool. You guys are you're on the ground floor of how we are making these decisions. Otherwise, a lot of our data is collected by our fisheries independent monitoring programs. But horseshoe crabs, you don't catch those the way that we trawl. And so we don't have good numbers. This is how we get good numbers. So thank you all. I'm going to say that a bunch, but thank you for that. All right, so now let me hit on birds. Um, so I mentioned the red knot. So the real reason why horseshoe crabs are even managed is this bird right here. And it's thanks to a lot of really outspoken and active birders who noticed pretty quickly in the 90s when the red knot population started to do a nose dive. They're like, what is going on here? They realized horseshoe crabs were not spawning on the beaches because they had been overfished by the wealth fishery. And so that led to the uh, Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission starting to, do, to put forth some effort into regulating. The red knots got listed as threatened. And so now we manage horseshoe crabs on the East Coast based on red knot numbers, um, which is really, really helpful. Um, so we, you know, like we make these decisions because we're trying to protect this, this listed shorebird really, so that it's that this resource, resource is shared between, um, you know, the, the bait industry, but as well as like maintaining populations of the other animals that rely on the horseshoe crab. Um, and red knots just are cool as heck. Uh, they land in Delaware Bay. Usually we do actually have over summer juvenile populations here, um, but uh, they land in Delaware Bay. It's about a 10,000 mile migration. They stop in Delaware Bay to refuel. It's like their gas station. They eat about uh, their entire body weight doubles in about two weeks. 
Um, and then they head up to the breeding grounds and then vice for our, I guess they don't, I should know that, but I don't know how they go back <laughs> um, because they, they only spawn once a year in Delaware Bay, but um, it's an incredibly important location for them. And so it's it spun off on a lot of like important decisions we had to make, but we didn't lose this species because of over collection of horseshoe crabs. Now, the other one you might hear a lot about because it is very interesting is blood. Um, there's a, a biomedical trait for horseshoe crabs and it's because their blood, as I mentioned, they hit like the evolution lottery. So they have been like well evolved. They have an immune system that is unlike any other animal almost on the planet. It is so sensitive to contamination. Scientists figured this out and realized they could collect the amoeba site, which is inside them there with the white blood cell that, that detects contamination and use that to test our injectables. Um, and so horseshoe crabs are collected for this trade. And I, you might notice they have blue blood. Well, our blood is iron based, so it's red. Theirs is copper based, so it's blue. And um, you actually might see a little bit of their blood when you're tagging them, because sometimes they bleed a little. And it is a little blue, it's bizarre. Um, and some like crabs also have blue blood, but they're much smaller, so it'd be harder to collect blood from them. Um, but horseshoe crabs have their hearts punctured and their heart is right underneath the hinge. So when they do bend, you can probably sort of see like there's a lot of ligaments and like tissue, but right directly underneath that is where their hearts are. And um, about a third to half of their blood is removed and then they're returned alive back out into the water. Um, and this industry or this LAL that they collect, um, they take out of that blood and they can use it to test uh, all of our vaccines. So if you've got a COVID-19 vaccine, you'll notice there's a batch number. That batch of vaccine was tested with LAL to ensure that it hadn't been contaminated by any bacteria in the process of creating that vaccine. And so that prevents us from getting sepsis. You know, like you could have, you don't want to inject bacteria into your body, it could kill you very quickly. And um, so that's why they use LAL. It's the standard for testing since 1987. Um, there's about five US companies that collect um, LAL, it's a, it's a huge industry, very hard to break into, as you can imagine. Um, and uh, it's, it's very important. If we didn't have it, we could die. Like you wouldn't, you, the risk of getting a vaccine would be substantially higher um, if we didn't have that. Now, and, and what they used before they used LAL was called the rabbit pyrogen test, where basically they would just inject a rabbit with the vaccine and if it died, they'd be like, oh, well, that's a bad batch. We don't have to do that anymore thanks to horseshoe crabs. Now I say half their blood, a third of their blood is lost. So it's not without a cost to the horseshoe crab at all. We shouldn't like, it's not like this is a foolproof system. 15 to, I've seen numbers as high as 30% of them will die from this process because that's a lot of blood. Um, and so it has a huge effect or it does have an effect on their population. So it's not it's not without a cost at all. And even if they survive, they tend not to reproduce that year because they have to rebuild their energy, their air, um, energy storage. So it, it's, it's very um, detrimental to their population, which is why management is so important. Um, and I don't have it mentioned here, but there is one good thing on the horizon. They've created a synthetic version of LAL. It's called recombinant factor C. Um, and it's been around for, well, over 20 years, like about 22 years, they discovered it in 2000. So, um, and it is acceptable as a substitute to LAL in Europe now with their Pharmacopedia or whatever it's called. Uh, the United States is a holdout. They are waiting another five to 10 years before they decide on that. But that is as long as Europeans, uh, like pharmacologically tested drugs are tested using our RCF, um, our RFC, um, they will probably move to that synthetic coming up in the next a uh, couple decades. And so that means this industry, this billion dollar industry will go kaput because, or at least be used in, in much smaller amounts because if you can synthetically create anything, then you're gonna do that, it, you know. So hopefully um, that happens, like in, in the near future, we'll be able to use this alternative, yeah. Are there any companies that are testing, like if we lose too much blood, you know, we have things that we can do. Is there any company or group that's testing to see in the you know, there are. So there's um, a company in North, or it must be South Carolina, that is trying to actually raise them from 
adulthood and take smaller amounts and just maintain a large population that they bleed less of over time. Um, all of the other, like the ones up north, I think that they figured out that they this is the most we can take with an acceptable level of mortality is why they're doing it. So it's maxed out. Now, I will say the three species in, in um, Asia, a similar, they do that similarly. It's not called limulus. It's called uh, Hersa. It's the genus of one of the species over there. And they actually believe them dead. So their populations have dropped substantially because of that. Um, so this is an improvement on that. It's certainly not the best that we could be doing. Um, so that that is, there are, and just, there is a few companies that try to collect. I think it's Charles River Lab in South Carolina that's doing that kind of research. Um, yes. Yes, actually they do. Yep, and that's how we got the survival numbers, like who's surviving and who isn't from this, because they would just never see those crabs ever again. Um, so that, that's another good question. Both good questions. Thank you both. Um, so yeah, uh, so that's the blood side of things. Fingers crossed that the RFC gets adopted. It seems like it's a one-to-one -one, um, from what I've read about it. So hopefully that is the way the United States goes with our industry. So overall population status, um, New England and New York are both declining. They have both have big bait fisheries and they have biomedical trades. And they're also hardening their shorelines just like everywhere else. But because of Delaware Bay's efforts, um, a lot like New Jersey and Delaware Bay and, and Maryland, that area, they, their population is actually rising because they've started to manage very, very closely tied to the red knot populations. So they know we really can't take more than this number. They're um, very pro uh, proactive about how they determine the total take in areas there. They also have like New Jersey has absolutely no bait trade at all. They just fully close it down. And Delaware has only the males. You can only take the males. You can't take the females because, you know, as you know, uh, there can be plenty of males uh, uh, with one female. So it's it's easy, safer to take the males in that case. So they have some interesting and, and smart management plans up there. Southeast seems like it's either uh, flatlined or, or rising from the last stock assessment. And Florida, it says hints of decline on East Coast, West Coast. Now, why are we here? That's why we're here. We're collecting this information every day. Um, I can say with the last, we've been doing this program for like seven years now. I would think that I can, we can sort of like roughly see trends and it does look like it's declining, um, but that's a little too early to tell. Usually you want at least the lifespan of the, or the reproductive lifespan of the animal to be able to make any of these determinations. So we're getting there with some of our older sites, but it's a, it's a slow process. Um, so this is what we hope to be able to contribute. The stock assessment was done in 2019. They do it every 10 years. So 2029, hopefully we'll actually have a determination of the population in Florida and be able to say it's uh, rising, declining or whatever, you know. Um, so that's kind of why we're here. The threats uh, here in Florida, as I mentioned, the aquarium trade is pretty unique to Florida. Uh, we also have development, as you all know. Um, it's rapid here, shoreline hardening with riprap or seawalls, horseshoe crabs cannot spawn there. Even if there's beach in front of a seawall, you give it 10, 15 years and there's no beach there anymore. So, you know, it, it doesn't make a difference unless you constantly renourish a beach if there's a seawall there. Um, beach driving will crush an egg. Now walking over a nest is not gonna crush it. We're not heavy enough. But if you drive a, a you know, a two-ton vehicle over, yeah, it's gonna, it's gonna crush that nest. So we don't, that's not a good thing for them. Sea level rise and shoreline erosion, of course, as well, are big problems for horseshoe crabs. So we have a lot of threats that are unique to Florida. Well, I did want to mention with the biomedical trade, there's no active biomedical licenses in Florida. Technically, you can get one, but it's very expensive to start an industry like that up. Like there's incredibly strict regulations on how you collect the blood. It has to be approved by the FDA. Um, and our populations are dispersed greatly compared to northern populations. They don't show up easily. Here and also generally our, the body size of our crabs is smaller. They like to bleed larger crabs because larger crabs have more blood. So, you know, it, it financially, I think it's why it's been deterred, but that is also something I would love to see just fully taken off our books. <laughs> but that's, that, that is, it has to make sense. So we need to know if, if we are declining, why introduce this industry? Um, if we don't really have to, if there's no, there really has never been a big problem. So that's one thing I wanted to mention. There aren't any active permits here. 
for that. And that with that, I would like to introduce uh, Woody William, Woody Woodworth, um, or Woodworth, not no S, um, our Charlotte County Coordinator. And he's going to tell you a little bit about the Citizen Science Program and why you're here in all the states, the high states. But do you need this or? I don't. Are we going to do the test now or later? Uh, oh, oh. Lena, how do I forward this? If you want to go forward or back, it's this forward. Thank you right there. Yep. Okay. All right. I actually haven't seen these, so this will be good. Um, basically, I can't spell arthropod, much less lineolus polyphemus. <laughs> But I am a citizen scientist, and you are too. What we just heard over the last 30 minutes or so is um, probably more than 99% of the planet knows about horseshoe crabs. So what we're doing here is, is going to be real important. And it may not be results that we specifically can see and hold and understand, but it's going to researchers and that's the whole gist of this program, is collecting data. Um, I'll go through and read these as I, as I go. I know some of the, uh, some of the lettering and everything's a little bit on the small side. But basically, this program has been in uh, effect for about seven years. Savannah Berry started it, and um, Berlina has taken it over. Um, it's in a lot of the coastal counties of Florida. And Charlotte County has been doing this for how long, Berlinda, right from the beginning? Okay, great. First of all, show of hands, who has done Florida Horseshoe Crab Watch here in Charlotte County? Okay. I know these people, and these people know me. Their relationship is strictly through email. So, uh, again, uh, whoever has raised their hand, thank you very much. These are the people that have really uh, done the bulk of the work. Uh, whereas all I really have to do is set up a schedule and then take your input, put it into a computer. So I've got the easy job and the volunteers are the ones that are really doing the, the hands-on work out there. Thank you so much uh, for doing that. All right, that's pretty much been covered. So what do we have here on the right side? Well, we have a female, and then we have the male attached behind that, and that's what we're hoping to see when we go out and do our survey. Now, mm -hmm. I need to tell you, a year or a year and a half ago, we did a survey, and we didn't find one crab the entire survey season. I believe it was fall last year, maybe. And that makes us sad because we want to find these guys. We want to pick them up. We want to measure. We want to weigh. We want to tag and do all that kind of stuff. But at the end of that particular survey, Berlin was thrilled that we had so many people show up and gather data. And she stressed to me, even zeros are data. It tells us a lot about what's going on in Charlotte County compared to other counties, the health of our water indirectly and things of that nature. So getting out there and volunteering for this is, is very, very important. I'll have a slide that talks about this just a little bit later. I, I wanna fast forward to uh, the trends that we've seen in, in Charlotte County. And essentially it's all over the map. As you might guess, a lot depends on red tide. Um, now, I'm not going to say that we don't have red tide in our Charlotte Harbor right now. It's really an interesting year for that, and I've got high hopes for this fall. We also don't have as much water coming, fresh water coming down the Peace River as we've had in a lot of summers, even though maybe where you're at, you got more rain than you possibly can deal with in your front yard, but we're not seeing a whole lot of fresh water coming down the Peace River in Mayaka right now. So that may have an effect as well. But I've got my fingers crossed that we're gonna have a, a productive season as we did um, in, the, um, in the spring. 
Reports go up, reports go down, more or less people on the beach respawning. These are the sightings that we've had in Charlotte Harbor, and I'm going to be talking about uh, where our survey site is. Uh, it hasn't changed for those of you who've done it before. And wow, okay. I'm going to keep going on this. On, on the verge. All right, diligence is probably the important thing, and I'm going to hammer this when we get into uh, my slides, and that is um, take your time. These guys will live out of water for as much time as it takes to actually tag them, measure them, do all that kind of stuff. They'll be absolutely fine. But doing the paperwork correctly is a massive headache for me if it's not filled out correctly. And it, as we all know, it's all about me. But just taking a few extra moments, and I'll get to that here in a second, of filling stuff out, uh, prior preparation prevents poor, that's something like that, I remember. Okay, boy, these slides are all interesting. Okay. I'm gonna give this kind of backwards because obviously the slides are a little bit backwards. Um, yeah. Let's see if I can maybe fast forward through these things and go in the direction that I want. Yeah, bear with me guys. You're getting the quick preview of what's going on. There we go. All right, so now I just have to hit the left arrow instead of the right arrow. Um, real quick about this picture, and I know it's not terribly clear, but it is um, a very happy horseshoe crab. Now it's not the kind that we have here. It's not the Atlantic, it's a tri-spine. But the reason I bring it up is I wanna give credit to the guy that took this picture. This is actually from a nationalgeographic.com article um, where they, um, that they did on the tri-spine, which is found far away from us. So these little spines that you see here, don't have to deal with those. Mm -hmm. But the guy, that gentleman took the picture, uh, Laurent Balesta, is uh, probably the preeminent underwater photographer in the world, does a lot of work for National Geographic. So I encourage you, if you get a chance, uh, the article uh, on these tri-spines was out just uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, it's really good. I've got a couple of his uh, pictures in here and I just wanted to make sure that he got credit for that. All right, let's see. The definition of citizen scientist is the voluntary involvement of the public in scientific research. So my ninth grade science teacher, Mr. Holly, wouldn't believe it, but I've actually made it to this point where being a citizen scientist is something that's really cool. Um, we don't get the publicity. We don't have a shark week for horseshoe crabs or anything like that. So it's an animal that's not, doesn't kind of have the cachet of a dolphin or a um, sea turtle or a manatee. But what you guys are doing is incredibly important for the research of this animal. And if you think that nobody's interested in horseshoe crabs, try telling a neighbor or a friend or a loved one that you're doing research on a 500 million year old animal lives in the water, but really it's more closely related to a spider than anything else, and it has blue blood. That's a conversation start. All right, moving on. I want to plug. Uh, this is not really related to the Florida Horseshoe Crab Watch, but I highly recommend anyone who walks the beach, anyone who goes outside, loves nature, to get this app, it's the FWC reporter app that cost you six. But uh, my wife used it just two weeks ago. We saw an injured dolphin, and that's how you report it to the FWC. Also, there's something in there if you're just walking the beach, whenever, and you happen to see a horseshoe crab, there's a way to go ahead and report that to the FWC, including a tag recycling. So, just food for thought. All right, left arrow. I'm going to cover the where, how, and when of this fall survey. Is everybody doing okay? I'll be done in about 15 minutes and then maybe we'll do a little bit of a break. Yeah. All right, great. So the where is 
Bayshore Live Oak Park on the north side of 41. I know the picture's not that great. And don't know if you know where that's at or not. But our good friends at Sunseeker Resort have directed this massive project there that will lead you exactly where the park is. It hasn't changed, it's been there for quite some time. We've done uh, an area in Punta Gorda before, but it was only accessible by kayak. And so we've decided to concentrate on this area first. Okay. Um, one safety tip, if you're coming from Punta Gorda into Bayshore Park, the, your phone will have you make a turn onto Main Street there. It's immediately after the Sunseeker project and there's no traffic light there. So we all know what 41's like. So just a safety tip there for that. As far as the park itself, about 10 acres, thanks Susie, uh, funded by a sales tax years ago. And um, it involves a long baseball road, um, several buildings and fishing piers. At the eastern side of it, you have uh, restrooms and a little amphitheater. Has everybody not been there? Visual. Okay, all right. As you proceed further down, you can walk and see a nice parking lot here, and then another restroom that I assume they built for ADA compliance. <laughs> so it's got the ramps and everything. Mm -hmm. That building is going to be very important when we rest here shortly. As we go further along, there is a um, park with uh, picnic tables. It's kind of a covered pavilion for kids with a beach in front. A little break with some um, red mangroves and then another small little beach area at that point. I don't know if the fishing piers are open now, they were closed for a while. But that's pretty much the layout of the land for the park itself. And I'll get into a little bit more detail shortly on that. This is a street view of that ADA compliant restroom. All right. So there is parking here. Six, maybe eight, not many, no, but there's six. also parking just <laughs> on the spots of that. There's plenty of parking there. The kit that we're going to be using will be located and essentially shackled to one of the pilings there underneath. You can actually walk underneath it. You've got clearance unless you're super tall. And there is our box. Now I thought to myself, you know, it would really be cool to bring in the box today and show everybody. And then I thought a little bit more and I thought, you know, they really don't care. <laughs> That's where we keep our gear. It's shackled through this piling and there is a lock with all the goodies inside. And the goodies I did bring, there'll be several buckets in this. Now, there is a lock on that as well, just for safety's sake. And the combo is 2722. One thing I do want to warn you about is when you put the lock back on after you're done, try to put it with this screw on the front. Because if you put a thing like that, then I have to go like this, the numbers will all be upside down. Not the end of the world, but my wife laughed at me one time when I had to do that. So we do keep it locked up. It's right there, ready to go. With all kinds of goodies on the inside, which I can show you during the show and tell as well. Oh, another, uh, another picture by Mr. Ballesta. All right, the forms. Again, this gets to the point where attention to detail is really important. We have uh, three sheets of paper in this book that you'll possibly fill out. The front and back of the first sheet is one that I guarantee you, you will always fill out. Now, the sheets are right here. And I really don't care if you put them on a clipboard or just carry this around with you to pull them out. Just do it for the first page is a uh, pretty much a, a release form. Everyone who's with you 
needs to sign this and fill it out each time you go to the park. If your spouse is remaining in the car to listen to talk radio, if they're with you physically going through this procedure, maybe uh, taking notes, things like that, just fill it out. Thank you. Plenty of these. As far as email address and all that kind of stuff, if you've done it before, you can just put a line through it and contact the name. But everything else, especially time in, time out, total hours, which is probably going to be 15 to 30 minutes, something like that. Okay, that's page one. The flip side is the beach nesting data. Now, I realize this is awfully small. Unless your eyes are better than mine, then you probably respond. Yep. There is um, a header at the top. And think of this page as my survey area. What did I see? Did I see a pair here and a pair here? And you just go, oh. you don't have to fill out more than one page. If you do, then you're seeing a lot of poetry crap. And it gives a general description of how many and what kind of position were they in. At the bottom, it asks for how many total did you see, male and female. And at the bottom, just each person put your initials, columns, miles padded, and educational content. Who, who cares about hours and all that kind of stuff? Well, the FWC cares. Okay, they're looking at citizen scientists. Uh, um, possibilities going forward and they're looking to see what kind of effort people are doing so if you travel 12 miles uh, each way then your round trip is going to be 24 miles finally educational contacts if you just walk the beach and don't see any horseshoe crabs and nobody's going to know you you're not going to know anybody you start pulling horseshoe crabs that are mating and putting them in buckets and measuring them and everything you're going to have a lot of friends anybody that's at that park is going to be there and they're going to be asking you questions and you questions. Tell them what you know. If you're in the middle of trying to get these guys sorted out and measure them, say, so just stand by a second, hang on, I'd love to talk to you. They're going to ask very, very basic questions. All this is stuff that I put into the computer at the end of the day, actually, at the end of the survey. Two horseshoe crabs together, that's a pair. Female in front, dinner plate, male behind, salad plate. More than likely, they're going to be connected at that point. This is more than one pair. And I, it shows up pretty good. I was going to ask Berlina about this. How many horseshoe crabs do we have here? I see two very easily, but person right here is kind of down in the mud. That's a female. And it's not just a female. You look at all the epiphyons and just stuff attached to it. That's an old female right there. So how do we pick these up? How do we identify? Is it a pair? To me, it looks like the head of this female is right here, and the tail will be back there. Does everybody kind of see that? So it looks to me like we might have a pair. That male might be attached, and this does not go up real well. But you can see R1, this little plaster there. It's down underneath the sand. My guess is that's your pair. This guy here is a satellite. We're going to talk about it earlier. So we kind of uh, call these uh, like uh, the villages right here. <laughs> and this is the villages on Saturday night. <laughs> what do we have here? First of all, you don't tell me this, good on you. And you're going to be excited and you're going to say, where are all the buckets? I need more buckets. Uh, I haven't asked Berlina about this, but if you have kind of a cluster like that, probably a good thing to do would be take a picture to begin with. Some might scurry off. But how I would do this, I would 
probably go from the outside in, get the satellite nails in buckets, and then work toward the center because probably at the center you're going to find a pair. You're going to find an attached pair. That would be my guess. So it looks like three. You might have as many as eight there. And there is a spot where I think four or above. If you find a, a pair plus four extras or above, there's a line for that. And congratulations if you if you run across that. All right. So we covered the page that's got the release for FWC if you twist your ankle or somebody wants to put your, your picture in the FWC publication or something. Uh, and then the flip side of that page was my survey site. What did I see? The next page, or we'll call this page two, is the nuts and bolts of what we do. It's going to remind you, I'll get the tags out. And I better get my ruler out. I better have the right side of the ruler out. And I better get the weighing device out and have everything ready to go. Now, I really strongly recommend that uh, if uh, Aunt Teresa from the Twin Cities is along or a spouse is around and doesn't have anything to do, bring them along. They don't have to have this training to be a reporter. And my wife is, is recording the board, and it's a huge, huge help. So bring a friend, uh, invite them to watch the videos, and which we'll talk about here shortly. And the more the merrier when it comes to actually sorting out the horseshoe crafts and getting into the nuts and bolts of it. This is way too foggy for me to read, but we do have copies of them, and I'll be available at the end to show you space by space how you do that. In fact, one of the stations covers this very, very well. All right, moving right along. The final page, yes. Well, I just have a question that goes back to actually the last church. Sure. Um, what you see, when we were doing this, some days you'd find 100 or 150 little molds. Other days you'd find 10, you know, you'd find all different sizes. Is there any value to that as an index? To what's out there in the general population, you want that reported? Oh, uh, not reported, but only because that means this is probably a good spot. Right. That's, that's the number one thing. So that, you know. I told you, I emailed you about it, but I know there wasn't a spot. Right. You mentioned that reporter and that links to our, um, our online survey for public reports. And we do have. So if, if you think you're gonna, it's not the purpose of this program, but it's valuable information. But no, it's reported there. It was just. Um, so in terms of damage, it's ready to buy damage. Um, absolutely. That, that's exactly what we need to do. If it's missing a leg, and I believe it even mentions R1, R, or L1, something like that. They're numbered from, from the front to the back. Uh, as you're looking at the top of the animal, is it the top of the front? Yeah. Left and right. Left, one left, uh, one, two. Clearly, if you have an older uh, craft, it's going to have damage. It's going to have scars. We're looking for things like in a damaged telson. We're looking for missing legs, claspers, falling nails, things of that nature. Uh, pretty plain English. That's the best I can tell you. Put it in there, and uh, that page will not be used by anybody else that day. So there's plenty of buffer there and you're just telling me uh, if you don't have it now, uh, I'll make sure it's in the Any other questions for me? Oh, I have a question just to tie on. You should have all the answers. This is a superstar. Uh, 
Um, when we do find all those bolts of the juvenile, you said you had an aging guy. I just, I was so interested in what they are. I also have a and you can measure it now. can also email you that. So if you find the bolts of a specific location, can you assume that they spawn there or do they travel far from the spawning area? Do you know that assumption? Like it's strange. People have changes that are totally but it's very, it's local. It's local. It's very local. If you're anything like me, all this information is kind of leaking out. Right I'm going to tell you that when you open the locker, this box will be in the top. And it is your guy. You forget everything. Even if you are paying attention, it's going to leak out sooner or later. Open this up, and it's going to have a ton of information. This is a fairly newfangled um, scale that we'll go over during the show and tell, but it can be a little bit tricky sometimes. It may give you Taiwan weight instead of what we want in grams. Uh, you should be able to decipher it, but uh, sometimes it's uh, Easier to spend a minute or two and read this. That's going to be fine. This is a license. So we have highly unlikely chance that uh, somebody sees you playing in the water and they say, Well, I don't think this is right. Cops, cops come, we go, Officer, here we go. You see you today, and you should be this far. You have a nice little welcome letter to me. Good, good luck. <laughs> but it'll go over the pages. In the water? Does this involve being in the water? Great question. And I'm going to get to that. But uh, you, you should go there. There's one person in your party you should go there. Crocs, flip flops, or just take your shoes off. Because these guys are. Yeah, there's an intertidal areas when they come up to spawn. So that there's even if there's a high, high, high tide, they could be in one to two to four inches of water or something like that. So yeah. Uh, we had someone last fall. Uh, I don't know if she's here, sorry. <laughs> but uh, she was quite upset because her partner did not show up. And she had just gotten out of work. So she was in basically work clothes with you know. Three shoes, found four shoes per house. They could still go. So you can still do the survey. That you guys said it's kind of the walk distance. Well, over. Yeah, I'll send you four clothes for three clothes for The three pages are in here. So you just go through it. Uh, and I guess we'll get to the tagging here in just a second. Uh, the pre I should say. But the other thing that we have is we have a picture of the area. So you go, oh, well, I got a park here and I got. Finally, this is the thing is. This thing is. It's got step by step. Do a product right here. And trust me, when we did the, the crabs uh, last fall, and Susie and I found one, my wife's right down. Many of you referred to this three or four times. You guys are like, okay, now what? There it is. I need to talk just for a second about what the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service considers the most important of this. Yes, the feds are involved in this as well. And that is, do I see a crab that's already been tagged? Big deal. Because it tells us how far they move. It tells us a lot of information. How old the crab will be that? You'll see the tags here. Big one, the females, small for the males. You'll always already know how I actually put a tag in. But if you find one with the tag, my suggestion is. Immediately take a picture of these guys can't. 
get that picture so you can read the number on it. Now, at your leisure, you can fill this out. And by the way, email or call me. <laughs> this is the cool stuff. And also, I will mention your report. Go ahead and report it on this sheet, but also go to the website and report because they'll send you a computer pin. All right. You're going to forget this. But I'm going to tell you now. This is the close up of our survey area. This would be the restroom with the very small parking, more parking over here. This would be the playground. And then there's some like fitness stations here for guys that want to do pull ups and run around. And all that That's the other. The entire thing may be 150 yards. Yeah, so it looks big, but it's really short. It's really small. Yes. So you're going to grab your gear, walk around the playground area, and this will be, be where you start. Now, we've recently put up a, a very small fence because you've got little kids in this playground area and they can totter, totter over and go right into the water. It will be at high tide, of course, very close to high tide. So you're not going to have a lot of beach to work with. How important have we found a beach with rocks? But we did it. We rocks there. And they're dusters. And you think, no. So, once again, safety first, safety twice, safety third, everything in safety. Be careful. Start survey point now is mangroves at this end. Very easy. You just can't go any further left. If you see, I encourage you to look into the mangroves. Please don't go in there and try to fetch or keep going. Worth it. But if you see them, oh, I've got a pair in there. It goes on the fish. You walk the length of this, maybe maybe four yards, and you'll run into some more mangroves. Back of red mangroves. You go around it, nice walking path here, and you go until you find the second here. Again, white beach. This time, maybe a little bit shorter. So your whole area that you're walking is not very far at all. And you're done. That's your survey. There are some picnic branches here. And I'll tell you right now, our times are pretty much midday this fall, which is good. It's really good. That's a good time maybe to go and have lunch. You want to take a little break or something like that. However, anything you see, Outside of these bounds, there's a lot of seawall down here, so you don't have to worry about it. You can put it on your hand, show them. It's nothing to do with our survey. Please don't walk the survey side, take a half hour break, and say, Well, I didn't see anything. Let's see if I see any on the way back. Okay. It's a one time deal. Look at this. I shouldn't say this. <laughs> if you get to the end, you better walk back to your car, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see it, of course, you'd rather you did see the first time. You're kind of fudging a little bit, but I'll take the heat for it. And, uh, it's it's really cool to find a horseshoe crab, but please don't do that before I get in between. It was outside the spirit of what we're We're a daddy guy versus what we are. I'd love for everybody to go encounter a bunch of these suckers, but um, stay within the, the bounds of the game, please. Okay, we're coming to the end. Yes. Here's what I'm going to do for you. Assuming that I can read your email address, that's how we'll communicate. Expect by Wednesday or Thursday for me to have a locker in place, fresh batteries, everything oiled up in good condition. Be there today, but it'll be there before we start. You're going to get the email. It's going to have two important links. This link is either Google site where um, 
you'll have our times up there. And I'm sorry, I didn't put all four rounds in there, but we got four rounds of three rows each. And this is how it reads. Round one, it really doesn't matter to you. We care about other dates. September 6th is the two, oh, I've got a doctor's appointment there. Wednesday, I don't like to play golf on Wednesday, but it's Thursday, 1.42 p.m. So you'll look at all the dates, all the times, and all you do, this red or magenta border is just highlight it, type in your name. Oh, I don't care if you've got two people in your party, if you want to put your name and then space and then somebody else's name, that's fine. But as this reads, and it's a little bit confusing, there are three borders for each date. So if you're, you go, you know, put a sign up by yourself and hope somebody else joins you, you'll put the name in probably the name. Ideally, it's a two person job. And in a perfect world, it's three or one. So again, and Edna, all you need you. No, or she grabs your icky, I don't know. Fine, you be a reporter. That really is the most important job. If you're signing up as a solo, I'm going to do my best to pair somebody up with you. Four rounds, they go pretty much by new moon, full moon. I think the, the full moon is just after September 8th. So these are all calculated by people a lot smarter than me. I just put in fall of 2022 and you punch up the best dates for this. And that's the other information or link that I'll give you. Oops. Can't be emphasized enough. Berlina's uh, former head of the of the program put out 11 YouTube videos. And you're gonna go, oh. 11, I can understand one. These things are one minute to three minutes long. They go through everything. Time after time after time. I always look at them every single period, and a lot of times I look at them twice because I just can't remember. <laughs> so that's pretty much it. Um, those are the two links that I'll give you. And I do have some frequently asked questions that I just kind of came up with myself. Okay, the first one is, will I get wet? Already been answered. Wow. One year that you can do that, you can have to be ready for one person is probably going to get at least up over their, maybe up to their ankles. I can't be there exactly on time. Should I go? Yes. Yes. You can coordinate with the other people in your in your group if you don't know who they are. Email and say, you know, I'm just getting off of work at this time. I'll be there maybe 10 minutes late. And you'd rather not, you probably can appreciate this, give all phone numbers that you can see and call that. Use me as the conduit, and uh, I'll do my best to get that information to the other person. One of the other things that you can do is, and there is the uh, bucket, and there at the little um, stand on time, nobody else is here. Wait a few minutes and proceed on to your survey. They may catch up to you, you may see them with the bucket later, or looking around at you, say, Hey, are you with the Florida Horseshoe Track? Yep, I am. I already walked the thing, so we're done. <clears throat> It's storming like crazy. What do I do? There are kids and people asking questions. You're going to have a lot of friends when you start doing the work. So it's going to be basic stuff. Go off something. I signed up, but something came up. Back to this page. If it's the day before, you can squeeze out an email to me so I can try to personally do that time. Can I child? 
neighbor, etc. Absolutely. You've been trained, but we'll finish the training. Handle the crafts, you really know what to do. And it's, it's very important. Thank you for those who have done this for years previous to coming in today, because it just reinforces stuff again. Thank you. But the more the various way out of here. They're actively involved in this thing. They're coming with you, maybe carrying the fire. I had some of this. How long does this take? You don't see a horseshoe crab. I'm in the park. I'm going to get back in the park. 